In this video, you will learn how to time lapse Noctilus and clouds while you sleep. Hey guys, my name is Michael Thomas, I'm a London-based time-lapse architecture and cityscape photographer and as I specialize in time-lapse, not as much in astrophotography time-lapse, but I've grown fond of shooting the NLCs at my balcony automatically throughout the night as well as above London, I had a chance to do that a couple of times. And in this video I want to share this knowledge and help you shoot better time-lapses of the Noctilucent clouds if you're out and about shooting time-lapses or just want to leave your camera on your balcony pointing north and get some cool time lapses overnight all while you sleep. Let's briefly start what the NLCs are. NLC stands for Noctilucent Clouds. From Latin, it actually translated as Night Shining Clouds, and they also have a formal name, Polar Mesospheric Clouds, but that never caught on. So from now on, we're going to be referring to them as NLCs. So what are NLCs? They are ice particles that are forming 85 kilometers up in the mesosphere, and they get illuminated by the sun behind. So if you're between 45 degrees and 60 degrees above the equator, equator between roughly end of May and middle of August, you might see them above the sky and they look completely different to any normal clouds. They're really bright, almost white, shining clouds. This is probably something that is the closest astrophotography phenomenon that you can see from where London is being 51 degrees above the equator at something like KP8 or 9. It is pretty much next to impossible to capture the Aurora Borealis, aka the Northern Lights. However, some people say that it is not impossible. It can happen. I've never seen it. However, if you're somewhere like North of Wales, Scotland, top of Scotland, Inverness, yeah, I've seen videos and time lapses of the Northern Lights. However, round here in London and below us, NLCs are the next best thing you can get. If you want to learn more what the Noctilucent clouds are, Alan Wallace did a fantastic video with stunning visuals explaining where can you see them, how they happen, so go and check out his video to learn more about NLCs. And now we can jump into how to actually capture them, what settings to use, and what was my experiences last year, which was the first year that I was capturing NLCs, and I've captured a fair few of them from my balcony, leaving the camera overnight, but this year I'm planning to use this experience and actually go and shoot them when I see potential predictions that they will be happening in London, quickly drive to my favorite locations in South London about 30-45 minutes away from me and still capture them in time. How to predict how NLC is gonna happen? Personally, well that was the biggest struggle for me last year, so I just, if I was at home I was shooting pretty much every night if the skies were clear, because obviously you can't have clouds between you and the polar region. So if there's going to be clouds, it's going to be completely covered, you're not going to see anything. But if it's a nice cloudless night or there's big gaps in the clouds, you might see the NLCs between them. However, even if it was a completely cloudless night and there would have been perfect horizon view um, towards the north, there are days that the NLCs just don't happen. So this um, website with uh, these uh, radio charts are an indication of uh, what might be happening in the polar region. I am not an astrophysicist and I do not understand how this works, but if it shows colors in there, then something is happening in the polar region, there's a big chance you might see the NLCs. That's all I know. And the second best way to sort of get a glimpse and get an idea if the NLCs will be happening in your region is checking Twitter on the regions um, where already sunset is happening for me in London, that would be sort of Eastern or Central Europe. So if I see on Twitter people are using hashtag 
NLC alerts, NLC now, Noctilus and clouds, and posting probably photos from their phone that these are happening at the moment. That's a big indication and big possibility that in about an hour's time they will be happening around here in London. So put that into work wherever you are. Check, uh, you know, Twitter for these hashtags, and if someone is reporting them for, you know, two or three hours of uh, time change before you, where the sunset is already happening, there's a big chance that they will be in your place. However, sometimes you will see no notifications on Twitter, yet clouds in your area seems to be clear, there's none looking towards the north, so you want to set up a camera on your balcony uh, just to point at the north and seeing what you get. So, roughly, what are the times that you should be setting up? I found out that I normally set up around sunset time and let it run for three hours. And I do the same in a pre-programmed delayed start time-lapse mode for the before sunset because they are usually happening in the one hour after sunset for an hour, sometimes longer, and sometimes they actually can start like 45 minutes even after sunset. But these are the strongest NLCs that usually happen around July. And the same thing can happen obviously before the sunrise. So like an hour before sunrise they finish and they start two hours before sunrise. So I for safety actually start three hours before sunrise uh, and let it run till sunrise or longer if I want to capture a uh, day to night transition shooting automatically in time lapse mode. Next up on the list is composition, uh, angle, direction. Where should you shoot and where should you point? What lenses you should use in terms of focal length? Personally, as an architectural photographer, I never tilt up. I always use shift lenses, but in a way, this is about the sky and not the foreground. The foreground is there just to add a little bit of information where you are in the foreground, but it is all about the sky. So the foreground usually takes only the bottom part of my uh, composition as I do tilt slightly up. The same pretty much applies to shooting Milky Way. The foreground can be uh, converging a little bit because you are focusing on the Milky Way. Hence in astrophotography, uh, straightness of your composition and architectural lines don't really take the first priority. It is all about the night sky. I choose to shoot between the two of my fastest lenses when shooting the NLCs, the 20mm f1.8 that I'm currently filming at the moment and a 50mm f1.8. They are native Nikon Z mount lenses and I find them particularly sharp, even wide open, but I never actually shoot them wide open when shooting the sky and I'll actually get to that in a moment. But let's go back a bit to the timing and the power of NLCs. Around the end of May they can happen, they happened once this year, they happened I think once or twice last year, but throughout the June period until the sort of last week of June they still can be very faint, so they don't occupy a long space around the horizon towards the north. Hence, in this time I shoot with the 50mm. Then the NLCs can be stronger last week of June and throughout July, so I shoot with the 20mm and then in August I I would shoot as well with the 50mm pointing at the directions that they're most likely to happen. So where are the directions that they're most likely to happen, you may ask. After sunset, I wouldn't shoot towards directly the north. I would point a little bit to west. So capturing north at the corner of uh, the 50mm image and pointing slightly to the west. And for capturing the NLCs just before sunrise, I would do the opposite. So left side of my frame would be towards the north and it would be sort of capturing a little bit of the east view. And that exactly applies to the 50mm as well as the 20mm throughout July. I change the direction if I can reset the time lapse at around midnight. If I can't, I would roughly position it just looking perfectly straight towards the north because it would get me some of the stuff happening after sunset and potentially some of the stuff happening before sunrise. So with a 20mm that would give me quite a lot of field of view to capture them and uh, use 4K crop out of the 6K images that I would capture in the 20mm view. Now the exciting part, gear. What gear should you use when shooting the NLCs? Call me biased, I use the Nikon Z system and especially the Mark II, Z6 Mark II and Z7 Mark II, like the one that I'm currently using, currently on loan from Nikon, but my Z6 II order is coming next week, so I'm very excited about that. Why the Z6 um, is my personal choice? Because I believe that the Nikon Z system offers the best 
time-lapse features in any system at the moment. Nikon cameras produce fantastic photos and they are just slightly behind on the video features that other manufacturers and brands actually do slightly better. But when it comes to time lapses, and that's predominantly what I do, hence I choose the Nikon Z system. The features I've covered in multiple videos, why they are superior to some other cameras, so I don't want to repeat myself, but I will mention some of the things that I utilize when shooting with the Nikon Z system to capture the NLCs. So when it comes to a camera, I recommend you the Z6 system or just at least a full frame camera if you're shooting with another manufacturer. You choose a camera that can power by USB because sometimes one battery might not be enough or you have this dual battery grip or just a standard battery grip that can take two batteries that will give you juice for enough to shoot for over three hours, maybe even a whole night or if your system supports it, there are dummy batteries that you can plug into your camera and then put it all the way to the mains system so that it will power continuously forever. I do love about the Z6 II and Z7 II series that they can power via USB and still continue shooting where my Z6 that I was using before could only power it and not work at that time. So I'm really looking forward to upgrading to the Z6 II for that reason. Next up, memory. Probably the bigger card, the better, because you're gonna be capturing images for three hours after sunset and three hours before sunrise. And at the interval of around seven to 10 seconds, which is my preference, you need some serious storage. 128 or ideally a 256 gigabytes card is probably recommended for shooting an overnight at these intervals if you're just planning to leave the camera and let it go throughout the night to get a smooth, nice bit of video for the after sunset and before sunrise NLC. If you're gonna be out and about, most likely you're gonna be shooting on a tripod. The sturdier the tripod, the better, because you don't want any shake throughout the time lapse. While when I'm at home, I'm shooting on this clamp because I can mount the camera to a slightly higher elevation on my balcony, and I don't have to worry about it wobbling at any sort of wind, because this is very sturdy. You clamp it really strong, and this is not the only support that I rely on. What I also then do is attach a leash around the camera connected to um, one of these Peak Design clips. I do really like Peak Design for these clips. And this goes around another sort of uh, anchor, another attachment, just in case something would have happened. I would not want my camera falling onto someone's balcony, crashing it, destroying it. So always have at least two points of support. So one, this should not fail, but just in case it does, I have a leash. Of course, you will also need an intervalometer, external one, or if your camera system supports an internal intervalometer, then it's fantastic too. Thankfully, the Nikon Z system's fantastic feature is it offers an internal intervalometer that can save raw files, while at the same time, it actually compiles a 4K video which is a fantastic addition to the Mark II series of the Z6 and Z7, which I utilize literally every time. And for that reason, I don't have to choose between shooting uh, raw time lapses or video 4K time lapses, which quite a lot of cameras now do. Even the Z6, Z7 original Mark I series could choose to shoot a 4K in body in full frame or crop, which I used to do last year, but that was giving me the sacrifice that I'd never had the raw files. So I was shooting the video 4K in around end of May or throughout the June period, and then later on in August. While in July, I tried to focus on shooting more raw time lapses because I would compile them later and they would be way, way better quality. But with the Mark IIs now, I can actually save the rows and it will automatically generate me the 4K time lapse. And if nothing happens that night or the NLCs were really faint and not strong enough, worthy enough to spend my time editing the raw files, I just keep the 4K file and format the card with the raw images in body and just have a 4K video of it because it's sometimes good enough. So it is up to you if you want to shoot the raw sequences and then having to put the files together or when the NLC's predictions are faint, just shoot the 4K time lapse in body if your camera can do so and you're still gonna get a fantastic video at the end of it. Also, if you're leaving your camera on your balcony and shooting throughout the night, well, remember that weather can change. It suddenly can start raining. And even though this camera and system is weather proof and it can definitely deal with rain, for the reason that I will explain you later, as I unscrew my lenses when shooting in aperture priority, I also always leave it in this rain protector. 
because it just offers the extra safety that no water will get anywhere inside any of the electronics and damage my camera. So when you're shooting outside throughout the night, definitely get one of these because it will potentially save your camera. But you may not have a balcony or a garden with a north facing view or a window that can open towards the north to shoot not through a window and you only have a window that just opens slightly so you have to shoot through a window. Well, in that case, I definitely recommend you shooting with a lens skirt. So a lens skirt is this very expensive bit of cloth at 50 pounds with some suction cups and uh, this string that wraps around your camera that I will demonstrate briefly. These suction cups attach to the window and then the camera is basically in an enclosure of darkness that if you turn on the light perhaps in the room that you're shooting, the light leak will still not happen in the reflection between the camera and the window that you're shooting through. And that way you don't have to have special covers just in case it rains in the middle of the night and you can leave your camera running for the whole night if your camera, for example, also supports the dummy battery that you uh, replace, put it in, and the cable then runs to your main and can power your camera throughout the night. But you're struggling with the little bit of light loss because you're shooting through another bit of glass, which will also reduce your quality. So I would always recommend to not shoot through another bit of glass. Open the window if you can, uh, shoot on a balcony, attach it to something, shoot in your garden, pointing to the north, um, just, yeah. If you have to, you have to get a lens skirt, definitely a worthy investment. And now let's move on to the settings. I tend to shoot with aperture priority when I'm leaving my camera to shoot automatically from my balcony throughout the night. Uh, however, if I was to shoot with a tripod somewhere where I'm capturing the composition over London, somewhere spectacular maybe, and I was there, I couldn't leave the camera, uh, so I had to be next to it, I would probably shoot in manual mode, but the camera would be connected via um, Wi-Fi to my Android device where I've got QDSLR dashboard, and if the composition was getting too dark, I would be changing the settings manually over Wi-Fi while the time-lapse would be captured by the external intervalometer. So that would be my preferred system of um, shooting uh, outside. But then at the same time, if I was busy shooting with other cameras, I would probably leave it in aperture priority. But you need to remember that you have to have exposure compensation on if you're just leaving to let it run automatically because otherwise you probably will get a lot of flicker. And that gets me to the second point. Aperture. The lenses that I recommended using for uh, shooting NLCs, the 20mm that I'm currently shooting on, and this 50mm, they're both f1.8. Fantastic sharp Nikon Z series uh, lenses that produce really sharp images even at wide open. But they are even sharper if you close them down a little bit. I've shot at f2, so barely closing them a third of a stop. But my favorite most sharp images obviously were at 2.8, so pretty much uh, a stop and a bit closed. However, you have to figure out if your lens will flicker the aperture, basically opening and closing it when fully connected. And there are ways that different manufacturers have different ways with Nikon in order to keep the apertures from not moving in your native Z lenses. I do a long exposure at the set aperture that I want with already a focus preset on where I need it to be. And during that long exposure, I unscrew the lens without touching the focus ring. And then all the electronics are lost between the lens and the body. And it stays at that set aperture, at that set focus. So then the focus ring just doesn't work. But nothing happens then during the time lapse. So I do the f2.8, set my focus, uh, do a long exposure, unscrew it and then start the time lapse. Next up, interval, either on the external intervalometer or on the in-body time lapse mode intervalometer. I tend to shoot at around nine seconds, but I've seen that between seven and 10 seconds, you get a really nice long time lapse of the NLCs because they move quite slow. You don't have to shoot faster because clouds can move much faster, but NLCs really don't. Uh, I've been shooting up to 15 seconds and that was okay, but shooting anything more than 15 seconds, you're not really Gonna get a long video out of the NLCs because they happen and they appear in the sky if they're even really strong for barely an hour I think so to maximize that I figured out that around nine seconds is my preferred interval for shooting um, NLCs and that nine seconds allows me to go into the next point which is ISO what ISO am I shooting I set auto ISO up to uh, eight seconds maximum shutter. And unfortunately, here is where I have to mention that this 
Features only available as far as I know on Nikon and Sony system that you can choose a longer shutter than one second for auto ISO. Thankfully my Nikon does it and it was one of the crucial features when choosing this system because it could do it. I choose eight seconds maximum shutter so that the shutter will go all the way to eight seconds and only after eight seconds if the composition needs more light the ISO will start rising and with eight seconds exposure and f2.8 pointed at the sky my ISOs usually get no more than 200 or 320, which are super low levels of ISO. The images are still perfectly clean. I'm super happy with it. Even if I wasn't shooting RAW and just shooting the video time lapse, at ISO 320, your video is still super clean, eight second exposures, low ISO, completely fine. However, if your lens is only, for example, f4, as lots of lenses are, I would then recommend you actually do shoot wide open at f4, and your interval, for example, be 15 seconds to keep the ISO low because then you still be at around 200 potentially. Set your maximum ISO shutter to 12 seconds or 13 seconds to give at least two seconds time for your camera to write the file before it starts taking the next long exposure. If you do end up shooting in aperture priority mode, what should be your exposure compensation? The EV plus minus? Well, I would actually leave it to zero if you're shooting RAWs, because most likely you will be able to recover all the bright stuff that will be happening, because NLCs can be really bright, and most likely the camera will measure everything correctly, or probably shoot a third of a stop lower to be safe. White balance, again, if shooting RAWs, it is really not important. But when shooting a video time lapse, that look is basically baked into a H264 MP4, which doesn't really handle uh, changing a white balance in post that well. Hence, the settings that I use is actually keep the whites, reduce warm colors in the auto white balance settings on my Nikon. And I'm sure other manufacturers have a similar auto white balance modes that just isn't standard auto white balance, but usually there are two or three auto white balance modes to either reduce colors, uh, keep the overall atmosphere or, or increase warm colors. Definitely go for the reduce warm colors. And that's it when it comes to shooting NLC time lapses. And the best thing about time lapses, you can also just extract one of the raw files from that time lapse re-edit it completely stronger than you would edit a time lapse and use it as a photo and you've got a raw photo. If you're not even planning to put together the time lapse into a video, you basically got a huge choice of photos of different NLCs happening if they happen and you choose which photos you end up using. So that's why I would recommend you shoot a time lapse of NLCs instead of just normal photos. And you have to shoot a time lapse if you want to shoot it automatically. So this system allows me to do that and that's why I've been shooting loads of NLCs last year and I'm still shooting it this year. Quite frankly, this year hasn't been as successful so far. I'm filming this on the 12th of June, and to this date, this year, I've kind of seen the NLCs twice, maybe three times. Once, I couldn't shoot it. Second time, it was barely between clouds, and only upon a heavy edit of a raw photo, you could somewhat see the NLCs, and the third time, I got somewhat faint NLCs. So I'm still waiting for the strong NLCs, which should be happening from now towards the end of June and definitely in July. The ones I got last year, some of them are fantastic, spectacular, and I one time did get a chance to shoot them actually next to the skyscrapers from Rover Hive in London, and it was fantastic. This year, if I'm seeing on Twitter around the East uh, Europe, the NLCs happening. I'm jumping into the car and I'm trying to get the NLCs from much cooler locations. And that is what I'm planning to capture more of this year. NLCs happening above the London skyline or in between the skyscrapers. And I hope that with the tips that I've offered you just now, you will capture some crazy cool NLCs wherever you're based but you have to be between 45 and 60 degrees above uh, equator. So yeah, if you're there, you'll capture some crazy cool NLCs. So thank you for watching. My name is Michael Thomas. I'm a London-based time-lapse architecture and cityscape photographer. You can follow me on Instagram at London Viewpoints or subscribe, like, and comment this video for more videos that I show around London, best views in London, time-lapses from elevated unique viewpoints to experiences and walks by the river that you can find some crazy cool skyline uh, cityscape views too. That's the kind of stuff you can see on my channel and an occasional gear review or a tutorial how to capture certain special things because the NLCs are the closest thing to the Northern Lights as I've explained earlier. Enough waffling. Enjoy your day. See you in the next video.